everybody enjoyed their Sunday school class. We enjoyed ours during the Sunday school report. Adults had eight and sixty-three dollars. Juniors two and ten dollars. Was age five and thirteen dollars and fifteen cents. Play the team fifteen by Walton eight sixteen. All right, let's take some songs. Turn more than nine.
we're going to take up the offering this morning. <coughs> we have any prayer requests this morning? Remember my family, especially uh, Josh's parents and his kids.207 207 first to last third to last Yeah. <laughs> 
Bibles this morning. Uh, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at, uh, well, we're going to begin reading in verse 1 uh, this morning. So Matthew chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse <coughs> number 1. This morning we're going to be uh, talking about and uh, looking a little bit at uh, the uh, first gospel. Uh, that is uh, the first message uh, that we see recorded uh, there in the New Testament. The first gospel uh, that was preached and that was heralded. Uh, and of course in this case it came by the first herald that you find in the New Testament. And that of course is John the Baptist. Uh, when you think about uh, the gospel and the message that it is and the power that it has, you know, we think of the fact that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to anyone who believes. We think of the times that uh, Christ preached, but more importantly, a lot of times we think of uh, the message of the gospel. So as we, uh, the message of the gospel is, it is found in uh, the New Testament letters. Paul said the gospel was what? The fact that uh, Christ died according to the scriptures was buried, that he rose again the third day. But the gospel message, uh, as it stands as a message of, of hope, uh, was really first preached uh, by John the Baptist as he began to preach and declare the word of God, uh, and it was followed uh, by Christ. As you look at the message that John the Baptist preached, as you look at the, the gospel, the way that John preached it, uh, we find that it is the same message uh, that we still preach today. As a matter of fact, in its essence, it's also the very same thing that Christ came uh, preaching. You know, and Paul would later talk of the fact of how that there is but only one gospel. Uh, there isn't two, there's not three, there's not, you know, dealer's choice. You know, pick which point you want. There's only one gospel. It's never changed. Uh, the message, the plan of salvation has been the same from the beginning uh, until now. Uh, and it has always been one of hope, uh, not through good deeds, but one of hope uh, through faith. Beginning in verse 1 of our text there in Matthew 3, it says, And in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent ye, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair, and a leather girdle about his loins, his meat was locusts and wild honey. And then went out to him, Jerusalem, and all Judah, and all the region round about Jordan were baptized of them in Jordan, confessing their sins. For when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruit, be for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cast to the fire. I need baptized with water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. Uh, he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, is, but he will burn up the chafe with unquenchable fire. As you look at the ministry of John the Baptist, you need to understand a little bit of the backdrop to what is occurring here. Uh, the nation of Israel, uh, having now been under the, the rule of Rome for many years, uh, they were sitting at a time uh, when the uh, Judaism uh, had become that. It had become ritual, uh, religion, and it had become ritual. Uh, the Old Testament law was there. Uh, it was taught, but it was no longer taught uh, by the bulk of 
the Jewish leadership as a means of knowing God or drawing nearer to God. It was taught as ritual. Uh, it had become in the, what in the minds of many of the Jewish leadership a uh, means of control of the people. Uh, there was no care. There was no concern or compassion for the people of God anymore. It had gone from being the word of God and the works of God to being, well, the works of men. Just another set of rituals. And so when John the Baptist came on the scene, uh, you can immediately see, uh, even in our verses, the, the impact that it had. Uh, it had a vast impact because what he did and what he said was so very vastly different uh, than what all the other Jews at that time were teaching. It made an impact because as the word of God was preached, as the word of God went forth, it had an impact. The same thing we've uh, been seeing in the book of Acts. When the word of God is preached, the word of God has power. It made an impact. There was power to that. Men wanted to hear and to understand. Uh, that is why that you find such a great reception there in, in verse 5, where it talks about how the Jerusalem, Judea, and, and all the regions around about uh, came out uh, to hear him. Uh, they didn't go out because he was some great, you know, uh, fancy speaker or because he was uh, had all the, the thrills, the excitements. He wasn't preaching in, you know, some great open theater where you just, you just had to go to this great attraction. He was out there uh, preaching in the wilderness. He was out there preaching in the, the dry land, and he was preaching by the River Jordan. Uh, wasn't the most you know comfortable area. It wasn't anything there. Men were going to him. Uh, they were going to hear him uh, because of the message that he had. It was impacting people, and so people were coming from Jerusalem, uh, the immediate areas, and basically anybody who heard uh, about him who could go went. Uh, they went to hear the message of John the Baptist. It was making a, a great impact upon their lives. This is why uh, many of the Pharisees and Sadducees in verse 7 came to examine and to hear him, uh, not because they wanted to learn, but because they wanted to examine. They wanted to find ways to, to silence, in many cases, the, uh, the work that John was doing. Uh, this was a man who came on the scene uh, preaching, heralding, proclaiming this great, uh, important message, this gospel message, the good news that he was heralding, which in the simplest uh, senses, what he proclaimed was, repent, uh, the king is coming. Specifically, in verse 2, it says, or he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And really, if you look at all that we find recorded of his teachings in, in simple uh, statements, it was repent because the king is coming. Uh, you, you had better get ready uh, because the king is coming. And he is coming very, very soon. Now as you begin to look at the, the gospel that John preached, this message that's contained here, uh, the first thing that we need to understand and realize is the problem that is present here. Uh, the problem uh, that John was addressing, the problem that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the problem uh, that all the Jews had as they assembled and as they listened to his uh, sermon, they listened to his teaching. Uh, first of all, the problem ultimately was sin. That's what they confessed in verse 6. When they went to Jordan to uh, be baptized. They did what? They came confessing their Sins. Every person present, uh, mainly the Jews that were there, but even if they were Gentiles present, it doesn't matter. Everyone had the same core, the same uh, basic problem, and that was sin. Uh, it didn't matter whether they were uh, the most devout Jews from the best family lineage. It didn't matter if they were the most destitute, the most uh, sinful uh, person that nobody wanted to be around. It didn't matter. They all had the same core and the same basic problem, and that was sin. Uh, this was the problem uh, that Adam brought into being uh, when he chose to disobey God's command uh, and eat of the fruit of the tree there in the garden. Uh, Adam knew what God told him not to do, 
And Adam knew what the consequence was going to be. Uh, he knew that he was told that the day he ate of the fruit thereof, he would die. And he did. Uh, he ate the fruit, and he died spiritually that day. Uh, he and every man since has been born with the sin nature, and in a state of spiritual death, until Christ gives him spiritual life. That's it. Uh, by one man, uh, sin entered, entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death is passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You and I are sinners today uh, because we're born to sin nature, and we're sinners today because we choose sin. Uh, both of them. Uh, you are born a sinner today, and you choose sin. And those sins bear consequences. Uh, the wages of sin is death. Uh, but the gift of God is eternal life. But the wages of sin is death. Because you are a sinner, uh, you know that today the ultimate consequence of that uh, is death. Uh, death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Uh, <laughs> sin brings death. Uh, that's the penalty. That's the consequence of sin. You see, every individual that John was preaching to at this time had that same problem. They were all sinners. Uh, they had all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Uh, they had the problem of sin, and they needed a remedy. They needed a, a solution to that problem. Because sin and its uh, condition, its consequence of death, uh, also brought with it uh, the uh, separation from God. Uh, man could not have a relationship with God because of the sin. Uh, God's holy. Uh, God's righteous. Uh, God is good. Uh, sin is the opposite of that. Sin is unrighteousness. Sin is unholy. Sin is uh, bad. Uh, that is what sin is. Uh, God cannot look upon sin. He can't. Uh, God's holy. Uh, he is a pure eyes and to behold iniquity. Uh, you and I, as the uh, as people today, uh, we were made to have a relationship with God, but our sin destroyed that. Our sin broke that. Uh, and our sin must be remedied if we are going uh, to have a relationship with God. The Jews in the days of John the Baptist uh, had uh, some ideas, they had some thoughts, they had some hopes uh, about how to remedy that problem, uh, but all of their solutions only further complicated matters in their mind. All their solutions actually only highlighted the, the depth and the extent of their sin and of their depravity. Uh, it says you know, they came to John. Uh, John demanded uh, fruits before repentance, but uh, John knew in their hearts in verse 9 he said, they do not say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, uh, for God can raise up uh, children of Abraham upon these very stones if he so chose to do so. Uh, now, John is not Jesus. John was not omniscient. He didn't know what these men were thinking because he was reading their minds. He knew what they were thinking because he lived with them and their general presence for the last, you know, 30 some odd years of his life. And he knew the core teachings of Judaism. He knew uh, what these men believed. And he knew that they taught and they genuinely believed that because of their Abrahamic lineage that they were going to be okay. Uh, I'm not a Gentile. I'm not a, a filthy, sinful Gentile. So I'm okay. Uh, I am uh, Abraham's descendant. Uh, this was what they claimed to. Uh, we might be in a sinful world today. But because of our lineage, because of our descent from Abraham, i got nothing to worry about. Uh, God's just going to, I guess, overlook my sin. God's just going to uh, wipe it away because I am descended from Abraham. That very statement reflected the depravity of man because they should have understood. That they would have gone back and read in the law. They went back and read in the Old Testament scriptures. <laughs> they would have realized that you become a descendant of Abraham by faith. Uh, we, I may not be a, a Jewish descendant today, physically speaking, but spiritually speaking, I am a descendant of Abraham because I believe the same way that Abraham did. You see, Abraham, the Bible says, believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Abraham wasn't saved because he was Abraham. 
And Abraham's descendants aren't saved because they're descended from him. And the same way that all those who came before Abraham, which, by the way, is a lot of people, uh, weren't saved because they were looking forward to Abraham. That's not the way that it worked. The, the lineage it didn't matter. Their, their ethnicity didn't matter at all. Salvation, being right in the sight of God, is not, is not today, nor was it then achieved by their status, by their uh, lineage. It's not the way that it came about. Uh, there is no uh, one family group uh, that is going to make up all of the saved and all of the redeemed, other than the family of God. And that's the only way you become a part of that is by repentance, it's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, today it doesn't matter uh, per se what you are clinging to. It doesn't matter today what you're holding to, uh, whether that's you know your, uh, your your family. You know, well, you know, mom and dad went to church, and my family goes to church, and somehow I'll be okay in the long run. And if that's what you're clinging to, that's not true. And uh, the reason for that being that salvation is a personal choice. It would be uh, ease a great deal of parental burdens if they could choose salvation for their children. That were that way. Uh, every individual has an individual choice that they must make. I can't force you to be saved. I can't save you myself. It worked that way. God doesn't force anyone to be saved, and I can't be. Uh, everybody's a personal choice that must be made. It doesn't matter how good your parents were. It doesn't matter how bad your parents were. It doesn't matter how much they love the Lord. Hey, Lord, you have a choice to make. You must either choose to be righteous or you must choose to be sinful. It's a choice that you have to make. You can go back and read your narratives from the Old Testament scriptures. You can find a countless numbers of examples of how that played out. Uh, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. Uh, sometimes you had kings that had the worst parents you could imagine, uh, who served every kind of idol under the sun. And yet they had children that loved the Lord and did everything they could to serve God. And then you had parents and kings that loved the Lord, feared God, tried their best to live for them, and whose kids were the absolute worst kings, the most sinful, uh, abominable people you would ever meet. People have personal choices that must be made. Your family can't save you, no matter how much they may wish they could. Uh, your good works can't save you. Uh, that's the problem of sin. You see, ultimately the problem of sin is not only physical death but it is, and spiritual death, but it's also the fact that nothing you try, uh, nothing you endeavor to do, can actually remedy sin. Uh, you can work from daylight to dark. Uh, you can work every day of your life, uh, doing every good deed possible. But it is not by the works of righteousness that we find salvation. It's not. Uh, it's only through the washing of regeneration that we're doing that comes through salvation through the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, works can say uh, it is not uh, by works. Uh, we have been saved by grace through faith. Is that not of works of any man should boast? But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God hath before ordained that we should walk in <coughs> Then. You and I may be saved to do good works, but we're not saved by good works. Good works are the result and uh, not the means of salvation. Yes, we have a problem today. Uh, if you do not know Christ, then you still have a problem. Uh, and that's your sinful nature, uh, the sinful choices that you make. And there is nothing that you can do apart uh, uh, from accepting Christ to remedy the problem sin. Now the problem that we find here uh, of, of sin also leads to the next part of John's message uh, which was the coming judgment. Now there are a couple of illustrations that John gives here uh, to depict this uh, coming judgment. Uh, what he described there in verse 7 uh, <laughs> the, the wrath that is to come uh, but he described it uh, there in verse 10 as the axe that is laid to the root of the trees. And then in verse 12, it was uh, whose span is in his hand, or the, the willing fork, however a term you choose to use that for. Now, both of those illustrations, uh, first of all, the one being a vineyard, uh, when the farmer or 
as the vine dresser would walk out in his vineyard, and there are times you got to do a little pruning. Uh, sometimes that involves, you know, trimming off bad branches, and sometimes there's trees that just aren't any good. You know, they, they're bad trees, they've got no fruit upon them, they have to be cut down. And so when the vine dresser goes out uh, with the axe in his hand and he begins to chop down trees, it means uh, judgment's coming. Uh, when he's got the axe in his hand, he's about to go chop down something. Uh, he's already spotted some tree, some error in his crop. He's got to go and deal with it. Uh, when the whittling fork is in his hand, that means he's about to go out and thresh. That means he, the the wheat is, is done and laid out. It's done been ground and crushed. And now he's got to go out and he's got to thresh it. Which the threshing in those days involved that you know, generally you, you crush it either by walking on it or you had an ox that walked around in a circle and crushed it. And then the winnowing fork was literally looked like a hook. And you take and you scoop up the wheat and you throw it up in the air and the chafe is lighter than the good product and so it blows away. Uh, and then the good stuff falls to the ground. And eventually when it's all said and done, they separated it all out. And they kept the good and then the chafe was taken and separated out and eventually burned because it was good for him to have just take. Uh, but with both of those illustrations, uh, first of all, realize that they both speak to an imminent and a soon coming judgment. Uh, it wasn't that they're getting ready to go examine and see if judgment needs to be done. In both instances, the instrument of judgment is already in the person's hand, and they're getting ready to go out and to execute the judgment. Uh, when we consider the judgment of sin, uh, you and I need to realize that first of all, uh, the penalty of sin and the guilt of sin has already been determined. Uh, you, the Bible makes it clear. You know, that you can uh, read John three. Uh, you know, we always quote John three sixteen, but you let read a little bit more in the context. You skip down a few verses, and you find that Jesus explains that he that believes not is condemned already, right, because he hadn't believed in the name of the Son of God. Uh, as a sinner today, you already condemned. You're not uh, living your life hoping that at the end you're not going to be found a sinner. You are a sinner. And you are already condemned because of your sin. You are a sinner by birth. You're condemned because of your sin through an eternity. Now the judgment is already set. The consequence is already established. Uh, there is no, well, we'll just see how it all pans out in the end. No, we already know what the result is. You today need to understand the judgment is set. If you not believed in Christ, you're abiding under the wrath of God. You are condemned because of sin. All that you're waiting on now is for the uh, the vine dresser, for the farmer to go out with that wintering fork and the axe and actually lay down the judgment to remove the bad tree, to uh, remove the chain that's there. Uh, that means it's closed. And that means you do not have time to tarry or time to linger and to consider. If you spend days saying, well, almost you persuaded me, then tomorrow you may not have the opportunity to become fully persuaded. The Pharisees and the Sadducees need to understand uh, this impending judgment that was coming. Uh, they are already condemned. They were already sinners, and it was time for them to get ready. Uh, as a lost sinner today, understand that you are already condemned because you've not accepted Christ, and the ultimate penalty for that uh, is unquenchable fire. In the illustration of the chafe and the wheat, the chafe had one advantage, or that the, uh, the sinner uh, does not have. And that is the fact that chafe eventually goes away. You know, chafe is a perishable object. Yeah, you, know, you get the fire hot enough, and it may take a little bit of time, depending on how good a fire you got going, but eventually uh, that chafe is going to burn up. It's going to go away. And the sinner, however, does not have that luxury. Uh, hell is not a place of perishing. Hell is a place of suffering. Uh, the flame never dies. It's literally an unquenchable fire. Uh, once the lost sinner is cast into the lake of fire, it is a permanent and abiding flame. Your body doesn't uh, wear out, for lack of better terminology. It doesn't cease to be. It doesn't uh, burn up and go away. Uh, the fires of hell are unquenchable. 
and the torments that are there. Uh, that is what is awaiting. Every lost child of God. If you're hoping that maybe at the end that you'll be able to, to outweigh the the good the bad things you've done by your good deeds, it's not work. The sentence is already passed. The judgment is already set. If you're hoping that perhaps the Jehovah Witness and some of the others that believe in annihilationism, that they're cast into hell and they just burn up and go away, all right, well, you, you live a decent life here, and yeah, you may suffer for a little bit, but eventually you're going to burn up and it'll all be over, said and done. That's also incorrect. The fires of hell are permanent. Uh, they are abiding. And if you uh, make the choice today to reject Christ and to uh, believe and to abide in the wrath of God, to abide in condemnation, uh, then you are choosing an eternity uh, in hell. Uh, just as a child of God will have eternity of peace, joy, and uh, uh, happiness in the presence of God, a lost sinner who's never accepted Christ has an eternity awaiting them. Uh, that is the exact opposite. Pain, suffering, and misery. Why? Because they chose condemnation over salvation. Uh, they chose the pleasures of sin over the peace of salvation. Uh, what a horrible decision. Uh, one might say, well, if that's the two options behind the world, would you ever choose sin? Because of sin. And the works of the flesh are strong. The lusts of the flesh are strong. And many choose the fleeting pleasures of sin on a regular basis. Today, you need to understand if you're living in sin, judgment's already eternal. The judgment is already passed. And there comes a point in time that you need to examine and to make certain uh, that you have a truly accepted Christ. You know, before John ever got into expressing the need for the coming judgment, uh, what he also said was, first of all, uh, bring forth the fruits, meet for repentance. You think you're righteous? You think you're uh, right in the sight of God? Then bring forth those fruits. Uh, bring forth the evidence of that. Because in the end, he knew that those who were speaking to him weren't right. And they were abiding under condemnation. Uh, you today, uh, as a child of God, should be able to look at your life and see the fruits that bear out that salvation that you have had in your life. And if you don't know Christ today, then there will be no fruits that reflect that. You ought to examine. You know, as a child of God, perhaps if you do look at your life, and even though you know and you understand today uh, that you are a child of God, you know that. Uh, you know that you're saved, but perhaps you also look at your life and realize that though you might be a child of God, the fruits that bear that out, the works that demonstrate the faith that we have, they, they're, not, they're not there. They're not there the way we should be. You know, James said that you know, we can show our faith by our works. But I have to see that realize that, you know what? That's a little bit challenging because the works aren't really there the way they're supposed to be. You know you're a child of God, but you also know and you also realize that your life is not the way that it's supposed to be. Uh, you realize that you're not living for the Lord the way that God wanted you to do. You need to realize that judgment is also pending because all of us are one day going to stand before the Lord and even as a child of God, even though you may be exempted uh, from an eternity in hell, that's what the blood of Christ affords us, but we still have a day where we are going to have to have a reckoning and an accountability. We will be judged. So some of us are going to be saved so as by fire because of nothing to show for us. But some of us will be saved and will have many works, many rewards to be received because of the things that we have done. We all need to realize today that we all have a problem with sin and that there is judgment that is pending and judgment that is coming because of that. That means that you need to be saved today if you're not already. Uh, that means that you need to be living for the Lord today if you're not already. You see, as you consider the problem of sin and the judgment that is uh, fastly coming and that is approaching because of sin, we also need to realize uh, the hope uh, that we have. You know, the message of John it could very easily be considered one of, of doom and gloom if you stop it at the sin part. You know, when you think about uh, the, the gospel message from the need side of things, uh, the fact that you and I are sinners, 
Uh, we're separated from God by our own choice. There's nothing you or I can do to, to pardon ourselves. There's nothing we can do to, to earn salvation. That's uh, pretty doom and gloom. Uh, there's nothing good in that side of the gospel. But you see, the gospel is not the bad news. The gospel is the good news. Because once you've heard the bad news of your sin, there's also some good news. Uh, there's some great news. Uh, there is hope of the salvation today. Uh, there is hope for righteousness today. There is hope to be had and to be clung to. And that begins with the very person of the Lord. You see, the message of John the Baptist is centered around a person. Not himself, uh, but the one that he was sent to testify of. <laughs> In verse 3 it says, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Uh, make his paths straight. You see, John the Baptist was sent to prepare and to make ready the people for the coming of the Messiah. In the culture of those days, of a great king was coming uh, to visit an area, uh, then they would generally have a herald, uh, someone who went beforehand, and announced his coming. Uh, the king is coming. You know, this particular emperor or this great person is coming into the area. So you make ready. You, know, you get the big rocks or any obstructions in the road out of the way so he has a, a smooth transit in and so the people can be ready to acknowledge and to make reference to this particular uh, king, the royalty that was coming through. John the Baptist had a very uh, singular role. Uh, but his was not to prepare for an earthly king, but for the king of kings. And it was not so much a, a physical preparation in the sense of the uh, robes that he is going to be walking upon, as it was a spiritual preparation. The, the verses referenced there in reference to John the Baptist come from the book of Isaiah uh, in verse 40, chapter 40, uh, rather. Uh, it says... Uh, the voice of him that cries the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Uh, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Isaiah 40 and verse 3. Uh, both the word Lord there is a reference to the personal name of God. And if you kept reading, the individual that is referenced there is specifically called God. Uh, this person that John the Baptist was preparing the way for uh, was not merely some ordinary uh, person, but he was going to be God. That's uh, the express statement of the prophecy of Isaiah, that, that God was coming. John the Baptist preached and spoke of the coming one who was going to be Lord and God, and he was coming to uh, bring and to usher in uh, the kingdom uh, that the Jews had been long awaiting for. Understand today that our hope is not anchored in a religious system or in a religious ritual. Our hope today is centered in a person. Uh, it is centered in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. Which hope we have anchored for the soul, both sure and steadfast, which entered in beyond the veil, the author of Hebrews said. Our hope is Jesus. And he sits at the right hand of the Father today, and it's sure and steadfast. The chain that holds the anchor. It's going to break. Uh, the anchor isn't going to give. It's not going to fall apart under the, the duress and the pressures of life. Why? Because the anchor is sure. It's the person of God. Uh, it is the Lord. Uh, prepare ye the way of the Lord. The Word is with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Uh, Jesus was God. Yes, he was fully man, but he was also fully God. And that's the way that he came. Yes, our hope today is in the Lord. Uh, the message that John preached, yes, it spoke of the problem of sin, but it also spoke of the hope of the Lord. And you and I today uh, have hope not because God laid down a, a, a works-based plan that said you may be a sinner, but if you do this, and this, and this, then you're going to receive righteousness. That was it. We have hope today because God said you're a sinner, 
You're condemned because of your sin. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. So, here's my son. And the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. We have hope today because God saw the impossibility of our salvation and made a way for us to be saved. He saw you and I couldn't save ourselves, and so he sent his son to provide us hope. Now, you and I today would have no salvation if not for the plan of God and the willingness of Jesus to come and to be our salvation. Uh, He looked at our sin, and he chose to go. As Paul would say in Philippians 2, he looked not upon his own needs, but he saw your need. He saw my need. He saw your need and my need for salvation and is willing to uh, step down and to veil his glory in the human flesh to live a sinless life. And why? That he might die upon the cross of Calvary. He humbled himself even to the point of the death, even the death of the cross. Here and I today do not have hope uh, because of who we are and because of what we've done. Uh, we have hope because of who Jesus is because of what he did. We have hope because God loved us enough that he was willing to allow his son to die upon the cross of Calvary. Uh, God committed his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, uh, Christ died for us. Yes, the message of John was hope, not in good works, not in personal lineage, but in the very person of the Lord. You and I have hope today because Jesus is alive. We have hope today uh, because of who that Christ is is. You see, Christ died to provide us salvation. He died that by his shed blood our sins could be forgiven. Salvation could be obtained. And salvation is obtained uh, through John's preaching the same way it was obtained in the Old Testament times, the same way that it's still obtained this time. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That was the, the action that John wanted the people to do. He wanted them to repent. Uh, to turn from their sinful ways, to turn from their sinful uh, desires, and to turn to the Lord. Believe in and trust in God. Repentance and faith are two sides of the same coin. Uh, you have to repent of sin, but you also must believe in the Lord. It does you no good to turn from one sin to another. It doesn't do you any good to turn away from sin and turn on uh, to an idol or turn to some other uh, means. If you want to find salvation today, you must repent. And believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Saving repentance is always followed by saving faith. And saving faith is always preceded by saving repentance. Uh, That's why sometimes it says repent. Sometimes it says believe. Because to truly have salvation, you have both. Uh, Saving repentance implies that you also believe and trusted in God. Uh, Saving faith requires that you also first repented and turned from your sins. Uh, That's why when Paul was standing before Agrippa, he said he testified to men everywhere that they must repent and turn to God. uh, Same thing. Repentance is a turning from sin. Faith is turning to God. You must do both. Now you must today be saved by repentance of sin and faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Without repentance, there is no salvation. Without faith, there is no salvation. Salvation. That's why Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. The gospel message today is that you are a sinner, uh, rightfully condemned to an eternity in hell, but God loved you anyway, and he sent his son to die for you and to provide you salvation. And now all you must do today is to repent, to believe, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what the Jews there did, at least a good many of them. Uh, They believed in the Lord. They went forth in verse 6, it says, or baptized of them in Jordan, confessing their sins. You need to understand the significance of the the action of baptism uh, to the minds of the Jewish people. You see, in John's day, Uh, The Gentiles, whenever they became proselytes, were required uh, to go through really what you and I probably would just call baptism, but they had to go and to be uh, dipped in water and to be ritually cleansed to become a Jewish (coughs) proselyte. And so what you find here 
And when a, a Jew is willing to submit themselves uh, to this type of baptism, this dipping, this immersion that John is doing, literally what they are signifying and saying to everyone is, I wasn't good enough as a Jew. I wasn't good enough by my own standards. I needed something else. I needed a Messiah. I needed a Redeemer. Their baptism was a confession. It was an acknowledgement of all that were there. I may have been a Jew. I may have been born a descendant of Abraham. I may have been circumcised and kept the law the best of my abilities uh, all my life to this point. But that wasn't good enough. I needed something else. I needed someone else. And so do you. Uh, you and I today must come to the point. If you're a law sinner today, you need to come to the point when you realize that God loves you, that your sins are condemning you, your sins have condemned you to hell, and that there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. You have to come before the cross, to come before Christ, and confess your sins, repent of them, and turn to the Lord and believe and trust in Him. That's all that is required. It doesn't matter what life choices you've made in the past. It doesn't matter what family group you come from. It doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. If God convicts you, you today, come to Him today. Repent today. Believe in Him today. Receive salvation today. For there is salvation in no other. Uh, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus Christ. Yes, you and I today have a problem. Uh, we have a problem with sin. Uh, because we're all born sinners, we're all condemned because of our sin. We have a problem because of nothing you and I can do to rectify or to fix our sin problem. And that sin bears judgment. Uh, we are uh, a problem today because our sin has condemned us and because judgment is preparing to be handed out, to be meted out. But yet the problem of our sin and the impending judgment can be outweighed, can be overcome by the hope that we have in the Lord. For the Lord has died that you and I might have salvation and eternal life. I today no longer have to worry about the penalty of my sin. I no longer today have to worry about hell or the fires of it. For I know in whom I have lived. And I know that he can keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. We have nothing to worry today. A child of God has no reason to fear hell because when they know Christ, they have no need to worry because Christ has paid the sin debt. I pray today that all of us here as the children of God are ready to stand before him in judgment uh, to receive the works and the rewards that we've done. I also pray today that we understand if you don't know Christ, that you also understand uh, this gospel that John preached. Uh, the fact that you need to repent, to believe in, and trust in the Lord. That you will find salvation in no other person, and no other thing than in the Lord Jesus Christ. I think we'll let's have a word of prayer this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your word. Father, thank you for the gospel. Thank you for the message that you have presented unto us. Father, thank you so much for the content of that message. For your Son, who is willing to see our sin is willing to see our wickedness and our depravity, and yet y'all chose to still love us and to provide us a means of salvation for his willingness to come and to die on Calvary's cross and as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. And Father, for those who may not know you as Son today, may not have the salvation that you offer today, convict them and draw them to you. And Father, for those of us here today who are your children, who do know you, who have a relationship with you, Father, help us to ever understand the need to live every day in a way that's honoring to you, that one day when we stand before you, that we can truly hear, well done, and receive the rewards for the works and for the things that we have done for you. For Father, it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. If you will stand, and we'll have a verse of invitation this morning. If you're here this morning and you've never... Uh, truly accepted Christ, you're still abiding in the consequence of sin, uh, you need to repent, and you need to believe in and trust in the Lord. Uh, but if you are here as a child of God, perhaps you're out of fellowship with Him, or perhaps you have some 
uh, burden or need you to lay before you. Uh, your need might be if you'd come and be seen just a, a verse of invitation this morning. Number 109. 109. or anything before we dismiss? <coughs> All right. Brother Danny, will you dismiss us in prayer and ask the blessing on the food of our guests? Everybody should have a song of the funeral and thank you for life. Presented here, thank you for the services. Hope you have a great day. Tomorrow,